First and foremost, everyone, in order for us to smell something, odorants, which are molecules that carry aroma, must be airborne. And they must be actively inhaled through the nasal passages up into the nasal cavity. As you know, smell is temperature dependent. Everything is more fragrant at warmer temperatures, us included. One of the worst things that we can do is to serve white wine too cold because it numbs the bouquet and squelches aroma. You know this. But serving wine too warm also can be problematic. In the case of whites, the white wines lose their piquancy, their acidity, they taste flat or flabby, and a red wine served too warm will taste of its alcohol. That old adage of serving red wine at room temperature was written before the days of central heating. Now, 80% of what we call taste is actually smell. And there are five tastes, sweet, sour, salt, bitter, and umami, which is savory. That's it. Everything people commonly associate with flavor, peaches, pears, pineapple, banana, it's all aroma. Flavor is aroma, or more precisely, an in-mouth smell. Some people have even gone so far as to say that there is floroma, a word that describes really the interaction between the palate and the nose. Now, we smell in two ways. Odorants are inhaled through the nasal passages, here, or through the retronasal passage, here, at the back of the palate, and pass through the terminate bones in the nasal cavity to this, the epithelium. The epithelium is a dime-sized piece of sensory tissue that kind of looks like a, uh, a sea anemone. You see these finger-like projections. They're mucus-coated. The epithelium thelium, excuse me, contains millions of olfactory nerve cells, and each nerve cell has receptor sites that react with an odorant, generating an impulse that is sent through the cribriform plate to the olfactory bulb in the brain. Now, unlike our sense of taste, when the taste buds pick up a stimulus, they relay that impulse from nerve cell to nerve cell to nerve cell to nerve cell to the brain. With the sense of smell, one end of the olfactory neuron receives the stimulus from the odorant, and the other end takes that message directly to the brain. The message, literally, is instantaneous. Now, interestingly, only 5 to 10 percent of the air that we inhale actually makes it to the epithelium. And this is a good thing, because if more odorants got there, we'd be in a state of perpetual sensory overload. Now there are a couple of things, and I've listed them there, that can diminish airflow or interfere with our sense of smell. Colds or sinus infections swell the nasal passages and thicken the mucus, which decreases the odorants from getting through, or decreases the number of odorants from getting through. Smoking actually has the reverse effect. It dries out the mucus into which the odorants must dissolve, make it, making it more difficult for the odorants to bind with the receptor sites and transmit an impulse. Paint fumes, inhaled drugs, ammonia, aggressive detergents, they kill the olfactory cells, and it takes up to three weeks for them to regenerate. Now, from the olfactory bulb, the message moves to the olfactory cortex and then to the limbic system, which is responsible for emotion and gut response. In a nutshell, the sense of smell completely bypasses the cognitive analytical parts of the brain. In this regard, the sense of smell is a primitive sense. We react to what we smell, we react to what we smell, I should say, before we even consciously register what we're smelling. From the limbic system, the message is transmitted to the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory. What does this mean? Ha! With one simple whiff of buttered popcorn, whoosh, you are transported back to your first beach excursion. You can feel the fading heat of the boardwalk under, the feet, under your feet. You can hear the surf. You can feel the birds on the wind. And you think about copper tone. <laughs> the sense of smell is loosely linked to language. 
There are thousands upon thousands of words in the dictionary to describe what we feel, what we hear, and what we see, but only 800 words to describe what we smell. As a result, we often resort to simile when describing an aroma. We say, this wine smells like my grandmother's attic, meaning cedar. Within the world of smell, humans can detect 10,000 different aromas. We can be trained to identify 1,000. And there are approximately 300 of different compounds in wine, so there's hope. I want you to hold on to those numbers for a minute. Because interestingly, we only have enough genetic material to form 100 different receptor sites on our epithelium which implies that we group odors in some form or fashion. For example, different roses smell differently, yet we all ID them as rose. Scientists hypothesize that the world of scent is not comprised of 10,000 different odorants representing 10,000 different aromas, but is rather comprised of a smaller number of odorants that fit our receptor cells in different patterns yielding different aroma perceptions. So, in my examples here, if each of these keyboard symbols represent an odorant, then asterisk, and, caret, and percentage sign in that order might give us a fireplace aroma. If we shuffle the odorants around, it would give us a different aroma. Some scientists also hypothesize that the same odorants in different concentrations give the impression of being separate and distinct aromas. And there's a, actually a, a good bit of evidence um, stacking up in favor of this theory. For example, 2-methoxy-3-isobutyl pyrazine in low concentrations give us green bean. In higher concentrations, we'll get green bell pepper. So, this concentration phenomenon might explain why you might get two different aromas out of the wine glass before and after swirling. Perhaps it's not two distinct compounds that you're sniffing, but rather one compound in two different concentrations. Now, up until this point, I've been using the word aroma pretty loosely. Technically, if we want to differentiate Aroma is comprised of those scents derived from the grape itself, and bouquet refers to those scents that are derived from fermentation and aging. There are other definitions also. You can break aroma down into primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary aromas would refer to those scents associated with the grape, so you get flowers and fruits, for example. Secondary aromas would be those scents associated with fermentation, like butter. And tertiary aromas would be those scents associated with aging, you know, coffee, toffee, nuts, petrol. Collectively, all odorants can simply be referred to as the nose. Ah, a little chemistry. I'd like to talk about aging and bottle bouquet, or the development of bottle bouquet. Now, if you go back to high school chemistry, you probably remember that all molecules are in motion, even those inside the wine bottles resting quietly in your cellar. Molecules in motion, it's called Brownian motion. They're just bumping into one another casually. And over the course of time, some link up. Specifically, non-odiferous acids link up with non-odiferous alcohols and give us an odiferous compound known as an ester. So we are literally building scent by this collision of acids and alcohols and the linking up of these acids and alcohols. The most common ester is ethyl acetate, which is a combination of acetic acid and ethanol. In small concentrations, ethyl acetate gives the aroma of pear. In moderate concentration, Band-Aid. In heavier concentrations, vinegar. And in high concentrations, airplane glue. Significantly, 
Although ester formation, formation occurs during the aging process, some esters are also produced during the fermentation process, and they use the assistance of yeast to make the link or bond. So there are two types of esters. They're all acid alcohol bonds, but fermentation esters occur with the help or assistance of yeast action. So fermentation esters and those formed by simple aging Brownian movement. Vibrations break apart the esters into their separate non-odiferous compounds. This lessens the nose. You all know that wine cellars are supposed to be vibration free. That's why. Fermentation esters, if they are shaken, for example, if they experience vibration, can never knit back together because without yeast, they can't. Esters formed during aging, if broken apart through vibration, will over time knit back together. 